The new CX-60 is going to change everything for Mazda and I'm going to tell you in this video exactly what I mean by that. But I'll start by letting you know that even though this new large SUV kind of looks like a CX-5 or a CX-8 or a CX-9 outside under the skin, it is completely different. This vehicle represents a wholesale change of heart for Mazda throwing out a front wheel drive architecture and instead embracing a new large product architecture that's based around rear wheel drive and six cylinder engines. Virtually nobody else is doing anything like this in the year 2022. Most other car companies are embracing full electrification as fast as possible, but Mazda, well, they say there's still a market for traditional combustion engines and plug-in hybrids, which is exactly the car that I've got with me today. Now, I'm in Portugal, which is pretty exciting. My first time out of Australia in two and a half years. Very happy to be here driving the CX-60 plug-in hybrid today, but we will also be driving the other powertrains coming to Australia at some point in the short to medium term. So there will be a 3.3 litre turbocharged diesel inline six cylinder engine for this vehicle, which I think will be quite sweet. There'll be a three litre naturally aspirated Skyactiv X petrol inline six cylinder engine. That'll be the last to arrive. The first CX-60 to come to Australia before the end of this year, we don't actually know what powertrain that car will have, but an educated guess suggests it will actually be the 2.5 litre naturally aspirated petrol four cylinder currently used in the CX-5, not the turbo, the naturally aspirated one. So let me know what you think of that down below this video. But the big sixes are on their way. The plug-in hybrid is on its way and in today's video I'm going to take you through everything you need to know about this CX-60 and whether you should put your order in ASAP. We're going to check out the interior, the back seat and the boot. I'll explain exactly why this vehicle is so significant and the other new Mazdas coming to Australia in the next few years and then we'll take a drive in the new 2023 Mazda CX-60 and I'll let you know exactly what it's like from behind the wheel. Before we get started, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, and that way you won't miss our upcoming reviews of the CX-60 with the 3.3 diesel, the three litre petrol, and the undisclosed powertrain that's coming to Australia first. The big deal about the CX-60 is that this car is a push into premium territory in the larger SUV segment for Mazda. Now Mazda have been unabashed about their Mazda Premium philosophy for the last four years. So the current gen Mazda 3 and the CX-30 small SUV, they're already Mazda Premium products and they're in the market. They've got nicer interiors than many of their rivals, but the CX-60 takes it to the next level because not only does it have a pretty lovely interior that I'm about to take you through, but it also has the rear wheel drive underpinnings that I'll explain more about in just a couple of minutes time. But first of all, let's have a look at this cabin. So what are we sitting in here? Well, this is a European market CX-60 plug-in hybrid Hamura, which is the second in three variants that they're gonna get here in Europe. But none of that really applies to Australia. So I wouldn't read too much into what the Europeans are getting in terms of spec, because Mazda Australia are such a big fish in the Mazda universe that they really get to set whatever they want in terms of equipment for vehicles that come to our market. However, with this sort of sporty blacked out appearance package, this car will be called a GT SP in Australia. And I can also reveal that the top spec CX-60 will be like the CX-9, it's called the Azami. But there will be variants that sit below this GTSP in Australia, probably not a Neo or a Max, <laughs> but something like a, a Touring possibly will be a lower end trim that you'll be able to buy back home. And they've said that the CX-60 is gonna kick off at $55,000 in Australia. That'll probably be for that naturally aspirated petrol four cylinder engine in a lower spec, but there's not gonna be any stripper specials for the CX-60. They're all going to be well equipped because this car is designed to go up against the BMW X3 and the Audi Q5. So there won't be a true kind of base model in that sense. In terms of what the rest of the CX-60s will cost, we don't know, we will find out quite soon, but my educated guess would be that the diesel and the petrol six cylinder engines will probably be somewhere in the 70 to $80,000 range, whereas the plug-in hybrid will be priced up against vehicles like the Lexus NX 450H Plus, which is about $90,000 in Australia. The CX-60 plug-in hybrid will absolutely be in that ballpark. So what do you get for your money? Well better technology than in any Mazda currently for sale. 
There's a 12 inch screen up here in the center, which is bigger than what you get in today's CX-5 for instance, and it's running the latest iteration of Mazda's infotainment system. Primarily you drive it through the rotary controller down here. The touch operation appears to only work for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which are wireless, but they're also not enabled on these pre-production cars, so we haven't been able to test that. You do get a Bose stereo though, with a big subwoofer in the boot, and that sounds really good. Unlike every other Mazda currently on sale, there's also a full digital instrument cluster, and it's one of the best looking ones I've ever seen. The typeface in particular is really elegant, but unfortunately the customization level just isn't good enough to go up against the Q5 just yet. You can't put a map in the center, for instance, but you do get a beautiful analog style for your regular driving. And then when you engage the assisted driving functions, it's actually visualizing the road and all of the cars around you in quite an accurate fashion. But I'll talk more about that when we take the CX-60 for a drive. Now the cabin is quite wide, and that's because the underpinnings here have really nothing to do with those used in the CX-5 or the CX-9 or anything else you might be familiar with. So this center console here, this bridge is really noticeably wide. Your passenger's sitting further away from you and it's more spacious, but also because this car doesn't have a torque converter, the automatic transmission is much more compact and that means that your legs fall exactly straight, which Mazda says they didn't do in the CX-5 for instance. So the driving position is quite natural. One of our big bugbears about Mazda CX-5 has also been that the seats have never been that comfortable, particularly if you have long legs. Well, that's definitely been rectified in the CX-60. I was driving the car for a couple of hours today and you immediately notice the longer squab. The trim and the upholstery is also really high quality. And this isn't even the top car. The top of the range Takumi here in Europe, which we will get as an Azami in Australia, has Nappa leather, real maple wood, and beautiful textile on the dash inspired by a Japanese kimono. But here in the GTSP, instead we have this grained leather up here on the dash, which is a nice look, a different look, and metal-like inserts, copper stitching as well in the door pulls. It all feels really quite high-end and nice and actually higher quality than something like a, a Q5, I reckon. In particular, build quality seems really quite good, even though this car is pre-production. This rolled off the production line months before production started in Japan and I will pick up on a couple of floors when we take the car for a drive that will be solved before it goes into proper production. Down here we have climate controls, heated and cooled seats even on this second tier car, a heated steering wheel, quite powerful air conditioning which is good and under here we have this sort of twin entry center box with USB-C power for the first time on a Mazda. We also have decent sized door bins as well and wireless charging ahead of the shifter with a new drive mode select that allows you to drive the CX-60 in all electric mode or a sport mode where both the petrol engine and the electric motor work together in unison. Plus there's a blended normal mode. But as for range, battery size and our consumption, you'll have to stick around for the drive just after we look at the back seat. As we're starting to do more often, in anticipation of filming this review, I went out onto our community page on YouTube and asked for your questions. And we got about 75 or so, and quite a lot of them related to the back seat. One of them was whether you might be able to get three child seats across here. And I think it's possible. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to lug our two child seats across from Sydney, but we will film a review in country hopefully soon. But because this vehicle is really noticeably wider uh, than Mazda's front drive based SUVs, I think there's a chance of being able to get a third seat in here. You can do it in something like a Skoda Kodiak, which isn't quite as wide as this vehicle. So I think you're in with a chance, but certainly two will be fine. And that's because rear seat room is pretty good actually. Mazda have been noticeably improving their packaging over the last 10 years or so. And the CX-60 has a decent amount of room on offer. So I've got my driver's seat adjusted to my position and I'm six foot. Headroom is pretty good. This car has the optional for Europe panoramic sunroof, but you can expect to see this pano roof at least on the Azami in Australia, if not the GTSP as well. Mazda haven't really done panoramic sunroofs before. And so this one is quite big and beautiful. It has a noticeable join in the center, but it's still a lot bigger than the porthole sunroof that you can get on, on Mazda's other SUVs. Leg room is generous, toe room is good, shoulder room is good, and the back seat is comfortable because the squab is long and it's angled up. So you could sit in the back of this vehicle for hours and be fine. All those soft touch materials actually carry across to the back 
And the material quality in general in the interior of the CX-60 is really up there. Now, speaking of my driving position, one thing I forgot to mention up front was this car's driver personalization system, where you set your height and it gives you your driving position based on a camera in the mirror, which also recognizes you when you get back into the car. Now, the driving position it selected for me wasn't really ideal. It put the seat way too far back, but you can fine tune it if you want to with the seat controls. Now, back to where we are here. We do get air vents, certainly expecting them to be across the range, seat heating, as well as seat heating and cooling up front, two more USB-C ports, so that's four in total, and the Europeans, at least, also get a household power point here in the back. So often we don't see this feature homologated for Australia, but hopefully we do, because it's a really nice convenience to be able to charge something additional that perhaps the USB-C ports are not strong enough to do, like a MacBook Pro or some other laptop. They don't usually like to be charged via car USB-C ports. We also have a flip down armrest with two cup holders, but no pass through here in the back. Isofix points down here, of course. Being in Europe, this car doesn't have top tether, but they will certainly exist when this vehicle gets to Australia. Now, the CX-60 is definitively a larger vehicle than the CX-5. The two of them might look quite similar, but when you go to the dealership or you start seeing them in person, you'll see it's actually quite a lot bigger, mostly wider, as we saw in the cabin, but it is 4.75 metres long, so this is a large SUV. There will be bigger ones coming, no doubt about it, but the CX-60 is a pretty substantial vehicle. Now here around the back in Soul Red Crystal, you can see the design is a little bit harder edged than the CX-5, and we also have this additional piece of lighting here that extends into the centre of the boot. CX-60 all-wheel drive badging and eSky Active PHEV for the plug-in hybrid. Now you'll see that there's actually these sort of artificial tailpipes, fake tailpipes here around the back, quads in fact. That's something Volvo is also kind of doing on their plug-in hybrids, but I think they're dispensing with it quite soon. Not entirely sure it was necessary, but you can let me know down below. Now we're expecting a power tailgate to be standard fit across the range. It gets out of the way promptly, and it still has one of the nicest features carrying across from the CX-5, and that's this cargo blind that actually pins to the door and gets up and out of your way. 570 litres is the claim over in Europe. We'll see if that translates to Australia, but it's a spacious boot. Not the deepest, but it's very wide. And I've got Mitch's Pelican case here in the back, one of the widest that you can get. Sadly, they didn't let me bring 50 soccer balls on the plane uh, to measure the boot in our way, but we will do that when we get back to Australia. Underneath that boot floor, there's the subwoofer for the Bose stereo, but there's not actually a spare at least not one fitted to this European specification vehicle, but final details like that haven't been settled for Australia. Controls up here to close the tailgate or close it and lock the vehicle. And with that out of the way, just before we drive, I'm gonna reveal the additional Mazdas coming on this platform, which ones we think are coming to Australia, and a bit about the different powertrains you'll be able to get with the CX-60. Mazda already sells a whole bunch of SUVs in Australia and around the world, but the CX-60 is so significant because of the platform that this car sits on. Now, it's based around a longitudinal engine layout and rear-wheel drive, and the CX-60 will be available with pure rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. The plug-in hybrid that I'm testing today is all-wheel drive only, but the entry-level petrol engine will be available with rear-wheel drive as will the 3.3 diesel. Now, Australia might only get all drive with the diesel, but here in Europe, at least, there will be a rear drive diesel straight six, which actually sounds quite good. Now, I've opened up the bonnet, the gas strut assisted bonnet on this CX-60, just to show you how much room there is in this engine bay, because we've got this enormous beauty cover here. But if I lift this up, nice packaging there, you can see there's a lot of room left over. And that's because the plug-in hybrid is a four-cylinder. It's a 2.5 litre naturally aspirated petrol four-cylinder engine with a pretty sizable electric motor making 100 kilowatts and 250 newton meters. Now, the CX-60 plug-in hybrid can be driven in electric mode with all-wheel drive. And that's because the electric motor actually sits between the combustion engine and the eight-speed kind of electronically controlled single clutch automatic. This car doesn't have a torque converter. It's actually got Mazda's own new design of eight-speed. It's not a dual clutch, it's not a torque converter. It's a single clutch unit electronically controlled. So we'll talk about how that drives in just a few minutes. The importance here though, is that you'll be able to get this vehicle 
and its siblings with six cylinder engines. A three litre Skyactiv X petrol, which is naturally aspirated, but with spark controlled compression ignition and a supercharger, quite interesting. Technology we've already seen on the CX-30 and the Mazda 3 small car. The diesel I reckon will be a peach. That's a 3.3 litre turbo with stacks of torque. But the plug-in hybrid is nothing to be sneezed at because total outputs are significant. The most powerful Mazda ever produced are in series production, 241 kilowatts and 500 newton meters of torque. How that all comes together, I'll let you know. An electric range of about 60 kilometers is achievable with this vehicle and that's basically what I got on test today. But the CX-60 is just the first. There are four SUVs that are gonna be based on this architecture. Two narrow bodies, the CX-60 that I've got here, and the CX-80, which has three rows, and two wide bodies, which are focused on the American market, the CX-70 five-seater and the CX-90 three-row. Now, Australia will get multiple of these. The CX-60 has been confirmed, and we will also get at least one of the wide body cars, so either the CX-70 or the CX-90. The CX-80 is also still on the table for Australia at this point. The interesting thing is we think there's going to be a passenger car on this platform as well. Mazda have poured cold water on the idea that it'll be the six sedan and wagon. We think that's probably over, sadly. It's one of my favorite Mazdas. We think it actually might be a large coupe, which is another interesting vehicle to release in the 2020s, but certainly one that I'd like to have a drive of. There's also a rumor that Lexus might use this platform in future, but we'll have to wait and see. So now we come to the exciting bit, finally driving the new Mazda CX-60. Bit of a bolt from the blue, this car, and the whole large product architecture from Mazda. I don't think many people would have guessed that now would have been when a brand would have decided to move to longitudinal and a whole bunch of new combustion engines. But hey, as a car person, there's a lot to celebrate there and another generation of brand new sixes that are efficient, they're mild hybrids. That's something to celebrate, definitely. And we're also driving the plug-in hybrid today, which is certainly a nod to the future. And Mazda have already announced that there will be a dedicated EV architecture from the brand in 2025, which is in, you know, three years. So for now, the CX-60 and other vehicles on this large product architecture, their dip into the water of electrification is the plug-in hybrid system, which pairs the very familiar 2.5 litre petrol four cylinder engine with an electric motor, which makes 100 kilowatts and 250 Newton meters by itself. The engine makes about 140 and 260. And when they're working together, the outputs are really quite impressive. 241 kilowatts of power, about 320 horsepower-ish and 500 Newton meters of torque. And one of the reasons the CX-60 plug-in hybrid is better than a whole bunch of other plug-in hybrids we've tested is that even when the battery is pretty much drained, uh, it is still producing 500 Newton meters. Evidently, it keeps a decent chunk of charge in reserve so that you can always summon kind of those headline figures. And that's actually not that common for plug-in hybrids. So I tried my very best to drain the battery, I could get it down to one kilometer of electric range remaining, but it still felt just as quick. You know, merging onto pretty fast highways here in Portugal was an absolute doddle. Overtaking is really easy, and it even sounds quite good at wide open throttle. Uh, because the engine that this system is based on is, is actually quite sweet. Now, it is a four-cylinder, the plug-in hybrid, rather than a six, like the forthcoming diesel and petrol engines. But, you know, it sounds good, and with a pretty chunky electric motor backing it up, it actually goes quite hard. And as a bit of a performance option that also gives you strong economy, there's a lot to like here. And strong economy is another thing that Mazda have, you know, quite clearly pretty much nailed, I would say, with the CX-60 compared to other plug-in hybrids, because uh, on a, a fairly honest 100 uh, kilometer test in this car, I was able to get 22 kilowatt hours per 100 Ks, which is actually the efficiency of my long-term Polestar 2. Um, not that efficient for a full EV, it must be said, but a whole bunch of plug-in hybrids we've tested have got more like 30 kilowatt hours per 100 Ks than 20, so I like that. I also was able to get about 60 kilometers out of this vehicle on battery power alone. And I think that's a useful amount of mileage, right? That's a couple of days of commuting, even if your commute's quite long. In actual fact, I allowed the motor and the engine to do their own thing in this car's normal drive mode. And like that, I got 69 kilometers on electric power and used two liters of petrol in the process. So yeah, that's not a bad result, I would say. 
particularly because that was actually not being too judicious with the throttle, like getting into uh, this car's performance a fair bit, uphill, down dale in the hills of, uh, of Sintra outside Lisbon. Um, you know, getting to know the car, getting to know the real drive layout. Now the plug-in hybrid is all wheel drive, but you still get that really nice push sensation on the throttle out of corners, unlike a CX-5, unlike an Audi Q5. This vehicle really does feel quite predominantly rear driven like a BMW X3 and it is a good feeling and it makes this car feel a bit more pure, more of a driver's kind of vehicle. I do think the pure rear drive versions will be cool, particularly if Mazda does do a passenger car on this architecture with rear wheel drive, that should be great. But even the CX60 is fun and rewarding to drive. The steering has a bit of heft to it, probably appropriate for the positioning of the car, but the ride, I think is a little firmer than the CX-9 and the CX-5, which strike a pretty good balance. Passive dampers here, no optional adaptive dampers or air suspension, uh, unlike an X3 and, and those sorts of things. Now we criticize those cars because you do have to option better suspensions to get them to ride properly. With the CX-60, there's only one choice, passive dampers. You can go for 18s or 20s. I've driven the 20s today. You definitely feel hard road edges. At times it can actually be a little bit abrupt. Now, these cars are pre-production, so it's entirely possible that when we reach full production and you know all of the kinks are ironed out, um, the ride will be a little bit more supple. But I think for now, I would say it's definitely on the firmer side. We'll have to see back in Australia exactly how it goes with our local ride. Now, speaking of pre-production, there are a couple of other quirks which hopefully get ironed out, including that the plug-in hybrid's refinement between the petrol and electric changeover is not that great. There's actually quite a noticeable clunk in the system. Once it all starts working in harmony, it's great. The pace on board is actually really impressive. It's just the switchover between the systems, which happens quite a lot in normal mode, is not very smooth. So hoping that can be improved. Uh, but it's another reason why I think the, the straight six engines will be the real peaches here, because there's, let's face it, there's a lot going on with a plug-in hybrid. Great for economy. Even with a drain battery, I got 6.6 .6 liters per 100 kilometers in this car, which is, really impressive but there's a lot going on refinements difficult for a plug-in hybrid whereas that 3.3 turbo diesel and the three liter atmo straight six petrol i reckon they will be really nice certainly more expensive to run and i don't want to pretend like that's not an issue because it definitely is an issue uh, but i reckon they'll probably just be a little smoother to drive probably a little more enjoyable uh, to drive every day but who knows i guess we'll find out when we get to drive them soon enough Overall refinement's good, quality feels high. The driving position is really lovely actually. Nice view out over the prow, uh, nice looking gauges. And the sport mode is really something I like because it basically keeps the petrol engine on and it just uses the electric motor as basically a big turbo. And it, it makes this uh, plug-in hybrid actually quite, um, quite engaging to drive. <laughs> like so many Mazdas of the modern era, the harder you push the CX-60, the more fun it becomes, but particularly now that we're dealing with a longitudinal arrangement for the chassis, there's actually a lot to be discovered here. But I think the heights will be higher with the straight six because they are also 200 kilograms lighter, which is nothing to be sneezed at. The plug-in hybrid's two tons. It's a bit of a chonker. Lastly, on safety, really good lane trace assist. Glues you to the center of the lane. Much more powerful system with more logic than like a CX-9 or a CX-8, for instance. That's good to see. Smooth adaptive cruise, blind spot monitoring, and a really clear 360 degree camera, which is always good to see. So where to from here if you're interested in the Mazda CX-60? Well, relatively shortly, Mazda will be publishing all of the specifications and prices for the CX-60 all at once for Australian customers. So every engine, every trim, every option will know all of the prices on one given day. So stay tuned to Chasing Cars, subscribe and hit that notification bell as we will publish them on the channel. At that point, you'd be able to order the specific car that you wanted but the powertrains are gonna drop about every two months. So the first one to arrive, which we think will be the naturally aspirated petrol four cylinder with rear wheel drive, that is gonna drop in 2022 before Christmas. Then about two months after that, we think it will either be the diesel or the plug-in hybrid. Two months after that will be either the diesel or the plug-in hybrid. And two months after that, 
is when the Skyactiv-X X petrol straight six will arrive. We think that will almost definitely be the last to come to Australia. So it'll take about eight months for every CX-60 to launch. Now, from my impressions today, I think the plug-in hybrid is a really interesting option if you're looking to cut your emissions, dip a toe into the water of all electric driving, but with the quality of a Mazda, and this vehicle really does represent pretty serious build quality. The interior is lovely. But the one I'm most looking forward to driving myself is actually the 3.3 diesel. I reckon that will be a peach. The Skyactiv-X X petrol with six cylinders should also be a really interesting drive. And we are gonna drive all of them. So subscribe to the channel and keep posted about all of our upcoming CX-60 content and everything else Mazda launches on this platform. Those are my opinions. I'm keen to turn it over to you now. So let me know down below this video what you think of the new Mazda CX-60. Are you thinking of ordering one of these cars? Would you consider it over an X3 or an Audi Q5 or a Mercedes GLC? I wanna know your thoughts. We do respond to as many comments as we can too. So hit us up down below. And as always, thank you for watching Chasing Cars.